all and welcome to Stingray Tom's Florida and another Take 5 for Florida History. Today I'm looking at Florida's early sugarcane plantations which developed immediately after the U.S. took possession of the Spanish territory in 1821. While Spain introduced sugarcane to their Caribbean territories as early as 1500, they didn't operate sugar mills in Florida as it was primarily an outpost to help keep the British colonies in check. Sugarcane was grown during the Spanish period, but like other agriculture, it was for local consumption and not for export. Florida's commercial sugar production began after 1821. Plantations were organized much like the cotton and rice plantations in Georgia. They often spanned 5,000 acres or 20 square kilometers and could produce over a thousand tons of sugar annually. At the same time, small-scale sugarcane production took place on many farms. Sugarcane is still pretty easy to grow, harvest, and process, and who doesn't like the sweet stuff? Over the years, Florida's sugar production has significant tourist connections. The sugarcane plantations were popular places for travelers to visit in the first half of the 19th century. There was a string of them along the Atlantic coast, and at a time when there were few towns or guest houses, visitors often stayed on the plantations. Sugarcane was also an exotic crop to most travelers and was a must-see on a Florida trip. Then, after the demise of the plantations, their ruins became popular places to visit. Today, several of them are in state parks and see thousands of visitors each year. Coming up, I'll explain how sugarcane was processed into sugar and molasses, as well as to show the remarkable ruins of the sugar mills of five plantations and the hardware that was used in them. On top of that, I'll highlight my recent visit to a Florida distillery that makes a premium rum from sugarcane. Rum production was an important part of Florida's sugarcane economy. Several large plantations concentrated on making rum for export as well as sugar and molasses. This is a fascinating set of stories from nearly 200 years ago and ones that simply don't get the attention they deserve. Since these are antebellum sugarcane plantations, you can probably guess that all of the real work was done by hundreds of enslaved individuals in miserable conditions. Prior to the Civil War, there was a shocking growth of slaves in Florida, from 15,000 in the 1830 census to 62,000 in 1860. Slaves made up 44% of the population at the start of the war, nearly all toiling in the fields and mills of plantations. These slaves made their owners astoundingly wealthy and powerful and were the primary resource of the southern economy. Let's start with the small-scale sugar process. Like many small things, it's simpler, but it contains the same general steps as the commercial process. I won't go into detail about what sugarcane is, but here's a summary. Sugarcane is a tropical grass that's from Asia. It's in the same family as wheat, rice, maize, and bamboo. It was domesticated first on New Guinea by the Papuan culture some 6,000 years ago and began as fodder for domesticated pigs. It'd be separately domesticated in southern China about 500 years later. It's not certain when people began to extract the sugary juice from it, but the earliest information is from India, where there's written evidence of sugar around 3,000 years ago. Both Arab traders and Polynesian explorers spread sugarcane as far abroad as Europe and the Pacific Islands. Yes, sugarcane was already growing in Hawaii when the British captain James Cook stumbled upon the archipelago in 1778. Like all domesticated plants, sugarcane was cultivated to improve its usefulness, in this case increasing the sugar content until today it can reach 16%. In comparison, white potatoes have a sugar content of less than 4%. Sugarcane requires a tropical or subtropical climate with at least 24 inches or 60 centimeters of rain or irrigation, and it takes about six months to reach maturity. Since it's a grass, the stalks are cut near the ground so that it'll grow back. 
Successive harvests will give decreasing yields, however, and typically the cane is replanted after about 10 harvests. When done by hand, the harvest is backbreaking and requires a machete-type large knife. Known as a sugarcane machete, it remains commonly used throughout the world. Sugarcane proved a popular crop to the early Florida homesteaders since it produced a high-calorie and easily preserved collection of products including cane juice, molasses, sugar, and of course alcohol. The remaining leaves and crushed stalks were also used as animal food. Families would harvest it, strip the leaves, and squeeze the juice out using a sugarcane grinder. While these are typically called mills, I'll use grinder since in commercial production, the large building in which sugarcane is produced is also called a mill. The sugarcane grinder was one of the most distinctive machines on 19th century farms. The business part is made of typically three heavy rollers. The cane enters a narrow gap, crushes the cane, and squeezes out the juice. The watery juice trickles out one side to be collected in a bucket. The grinder is powered by a horse, mule, or ox. In this example from Cracker Country at the Florida State Fair, a mule is hitched to a pole known as the sweep and walks around in a circle. The sweep is a type of lever and the distance between the grinder and the animal is 10 to 12 feet or about 3 meters. You'll notice that the sweep is pitched at an angle by the mount which is known as the sweep cap. This allows animals to be easily hitched to the low end while the high end is sufficiently above the head of anyone nearby. It also means that the person feeding the grinder only has to stoop once per revolution. From my experience, most sweeps are the trunks of fairly straight pine trees, though as long as it serves the function, any trunk will do. I did see that this one, located at the Manatee Village Historical Park, has a pronounced curve. The sign that accompanies it states that the sweep must be made from a tree with the correct bend at the top. But as you can see, the sweep is resting on the ground and the opposite end is too low to be safe. The sweep cap is level in this model, which advertisements suggest would require a slightly bent trunk. Compare it to these others and see what you think. Anyway, once the cane juice is extracted, it's poured in a kettle, sometimes placed in a boiling shed. The kettle is broad and shallow and sits just off of a fireplace. The cane juice is watched carefully and stirred regularly as its water content slowly reduces. The goal is to make a thick syrup without burning the sugar. Once the syrup reaches the desired consistency, it's ladled out of the kettle and into containers. Here, it reaches the strike stage, and sugar crystals form as it cools. Along with the crystalline sugar, a thick black residue is produced. That's molasses. The results are three products. White sugar with no molasses, brown sugar which contains some, and molasses itself. When it comes to the commercial production in sugar mills, the process is similar. This early European woodblock print illustrates the steps of the process, albeit in a rather compressed manner. You can see the harvest of the sugarcane in the background. At the rear of the building, there are kettles with fires burning underneath, as well as people feeding cane into an opening that leads to a grinder. Underneath, the cane juice flows into the cistern. Middle right, a worker is pouring the boiled syrup into molds. On the far left, there's a water wheel which is providing the power to grind the cane. In front, workers are chopping cane into small pieces. What for, I'm not sure. But next to them, two others are taking the finished product of sugar loaves from the molds. Those are the elements of the production. On Florida's sugar plantations, the sugar cane was harvested the same way. It was backbreaking work for slaves, constantly bent over, hacking at the cane with machetes that needed constant sharpening, plus the ever-present threat of venomous snakes and nasty rats. It often be enslaved children who'd bundle the cane and carry it to the wagons for transport to the mill. Once at the mill, workers would feed the cane on a conveyor. That led to a crusher like the grinder, but capable of crushing many stalks at a time. 
The crushers, like this one at Yulee Sugar Mill, were driven by huge gears and powered by a steam engine. Since steam engines require a large and potentially explosive tank filled with boiling water, as well as a fire to heat the water, this would be contained in a separate building from the main part of the mill. The crushers would extract the juice from hundreds of pounds of sugarcane every hour, and the juice would be sent to another building containing the boiling room. In this place, there's another large fire to be tended to, as well as a row of iron kettles. In the sketch, you can see that the furnace is in the middle of the building, but unlike a regular furnace with a chimney above it, this chimney is at the other end of the kettles. The heat from the furnace would be drawn along by the draft passing under the kettles. The kettle nearest the chimney was the largest and coolest, and the one next to the fire the smallest and hottest. The structure of the furnace and kettles was known as the Jamaica Train, named after the island on which the British had many of their sugar plantations. The Jamaica Train was designed to reduce the cane juice down to the right consistency, though it was still a difficult and tricky process. In the days before there were proper thermometers and other instruments to test for things such as sugar or water content, successful sugar production came down to skill, attentiveness, and luck. The coolest kettle was called Le Grand. That's where the start of the reduction occurred and most of the water was boiled off. The names for the kettles were typically French due to the process being brought to Florida from Louisiana. Le Grand is the biggest kettle, of course. As the juice thickened, it'd be ladled into the next kettle. This would be La Prope, or the clean kettle, as this is where the worker would skim off much of the scum that rises to the surface. The next was la flambeau, meaning flame or torch. Then there was la syrup, where the juice would become a viscous syrup. This long process required constant stirring and observation to avoid scorching. Even though this was done by slaves, the workers boiling the cane juice had to be highly skilled, yet all the while, they're in a brutally hot building and are working closely with boiling syrup. One mistake and a slave would receive a horrible burn, scarring them for life. Once the juice had reached the final kettle, la batterie, likely a reference to the action of beating something, this is where the syrup would reduce until it achieved the strike stage, when it would start making crystals. From there it'd be ladled into a cooling trough and head to the next part of the mill. This process was done, kettle after kettle, until muscovado was produced. Muscovado is a partially refined sugar with a strong molasses content and is dark brown in color. The name is derived from a Portuguese phrase meaning unrefined sugar. The next area is where the muscovado would cool and crystallize. It was placed in barrels and moved into the wooden floor of the purgery. As the barrel sat, the syrup would slowly separate into sugar and molasses. The molasses would seep out of the bottom of the barrels, through openings in the wood floor, and drip into a cistern to be collected later. This was the final part of the process. From here, both the molasses and the sugar were shipped in barrels to northern ports. Much of the molasses was used to make rum, while the sugar was put in molds that made the solid sugar loaf or sugar cones that were used in homes. The inverted conical molds had a hole at the bottom that'd be where the very last of the molasses seeped out, leaving a solid white cone that was the usual form in which refined sugar was sold until the late 19th century. Because of the hardness, sugar loaves required sugar nips to break the loaf into small pieces. The nips needed to be strong and sharp and were dangerous. That's why some were mounted in sugar boxes. The mystery writer, Agatha Christie, even used a pair of nips as a murder weapon in one of her books. Next, here's a quick look at some of Florida's historic sugar mills. On the site of De Leon Springs State Park, next to one of Florida's natural springs, was the William Williams Plantation, founded in 1804. While Williams was English, Florida was under Spanish control at the time. Named Spring Garden, the plantation grew corn, cotton, and sugarcane, using enslaved Africans to do the work. 
The plantation was sold to Orlando Rees in 1830, who built the only water-powered sugar mill in Florida. In 1835, the plantation was destroyed at the start of the Second Seminole War by raiding Seminoles. It was rebuilt, and in 1836, the artist and naturalist, John James Audubon, was a guest during his study of American birds. The mill continued to operate until 1864, when Union troops destroyed it during the Civil War. The structure was rebuilt in 1930, and in 1961, it became the old Spanish sugar mill restaurant, which continues to operate today. The Bulow Plantation ruins historic state park is part of a former plantation started in 1821 by Charles Bulow, which grew indigo, cotton, rice, and sugarcane. Two years later, Bulow died and his son, 17-year-old John Bulow, took over. In 1831, this steam-driven sugar mill was built. Records show that the plantation produced 600 tons of sugar each year. It was operated until 1836 when the plantation was destroyed in the Second Seminole War. In 1831 and 32, John Audubon was also a guest of the Bulows. The site of the Dummett ruins was a plantation in 1825 when Thomas Dummett purchased two neighboring plantations. He was a colonel in the British Marines who had fled Barbados with his family because of a slave revolt. The plantation had a steam-powered sugar mill and rum distillery, and used his steam boiler, which he had shipped from Barbados. Much of the sugar cane was used to make rum at this plantation. When war broke out in 1835, Dummett moved his family to St. Augustine for safety. That same year, the plantation was raided by Seminoles and the mill destroyed. One of the Dummett's 11 children, Douglas, would create another plantation further south, focusing mostly on citrus. By the way, Dummett is generally spelled with an E, except on this sign. The Kruger and De Peister Sugar Mill, better known today as the New Smyrna Sugar Mill Ruins, is located on what was a small plantation near New Smyrna Beach. The plantation was owned by speculators from New York, William De Peister and Henry Kruger. In 1830, using money from Eliza Kruger, Henry Kruger's wife, a steam-operated sugarcane mill and sawmill were built. Only five years later, on Christmas Day, 1835, Seminole warriors attacked and destroyed the mill and other buildings. The plantation was abandoned and the machinery was eventually moved to a nearby plantation. The Yulee Sugar Mill Ruins Historic State Park is located in Homosassa. It was a plantation established by David Levy Yulee, growing citrus, cotton, and sugarcane, and operating a large steam-driven sugar mill from 1851 to 64. The plantation was worked by over a thousand slaves, and the mill produced sugar, molasses, and rum. Yulee was an important Florida politician both before and after statehood. He was the first U.S. Senator to represent Florida. For more information about David Yulee, see this recent video. During the Civil War, the plantation supplied the Confederate military with sugar products until 1864, when the Union troops destroyed much of the plantation and freed the slaves. The mill was left untouched as the troops didn't see it, but it never operated again and became ruins. And now, on to the rum. I'm not going to go into detail about how to distill rum, since there's plenty of videos that explain that. Most, if not all, of the sugar plantations in Florida made alcohol from sugarcane. Of course, the name we generally use for sugarcane spirits is rum. Rum was both a valuable and useful commodity. While some plantations made rum for export, such as Yuli and Dummett, most would only make rum for local use. As far as I know, there aren't any remaining large distillery works from the 19th century in Florida, so what I'm showing you are small stills from the Suwannee County Museum in Live Oak and the Museum of Appalachia in Tennessee. Today, the best way to understand the process of making rum is to head to a working distillery, and one of the most interesting in the state is tucked away in a forest near Weekiwatchee Springs, surrounded by the Chazahowitzka Wilderness and only 20 miles south of the Yulee Sugar Mill. Located on the Goff Ranch, 
Enjoy Spirits is owned and operated by Natalie and Kevin Goff, who started making Wild Buck Whiskey in 2010 and Mermaid Rum in 2016. As they say on their website, they wanted to make products that used crops that they could grow on their farm. They chose to make their whiskey out of rye and grew sugarcane for the rum. The Goffs and their staff are very friendly and welcoming, and the place might just give you the sense that you're a weary traveler who needs refreshment from one of Florida's early plantations in the wilderness. Open on the weekends, Kevin leads tours of the distillery, which is quite small, and Natalie handles tastings and sales. There's an open-air bar, the Bunghole, a friendly donkey, and occasionally live music. While most rum today, and in the past, has been made with molasses, Enjoy simply uses the fresh juice, squeezed out of the cane. They use a modern electric extractor, which apparently makes their donkey happy. The juice is poured in a stainless steel tank for 48 hours, along with enzymes and yeast, to ferment the brew. Once that's done, the fermented cane juice makes its way into a copper pot still for distillation. The resulting alcohol is put into wooden barrels to age. For the mermaid rum, that's at least a three and a half year process, which turns a clear and largely flavorless alcohol into smooth and tasty aged rum with a beautiful amber color. Enjoy is a very small distiller. They bottle their rum and whiskey one barrel at a time, though they make enough to sell it there as well as at retailers around the state. Both the rum and whiskey are 100 proof, and they also make an impressive moonshine from the rye named Rise and Shine that's an impressive 150 proof, yet is pretty darn smooth. I hope you enjoyed this look at Florida's early sugar production. It's a subject I've studied for many years, and it's a story that's not told often enough. I'll cover different aspects of sugar in the future, including the modern-day industrial production that operates around the southern shore of Lake Okeechobee. My friend Katie and I enjoyed our visit to Enjoy Spirits and look forward to returning soon. This video isn't sponsored by them, but it's a great place with friendly people and creates some wonderful spirits. Thank you for watching another of my videos. If you've learned something, please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel to learn more about Florida's tourism history. Stingray Tom's Florida, traveling through time around the Sunshine State.